Okay, okay, I think that answered that question. Recording in progress, yes. Thank you for the reminder, Ingrid, that's what that was. Hey, everybody, good evening, good evening, good evening. We are going to jump right in um, to tonight's session. Uh, once again, we welcome you all to BCYF session number nine, all about curating authentic youth voice and really thinking through youth-friendly programming. My name is Sadiq Ali, one of, one of um, your proud co-moderators, co-facilitators. I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, Renee, if you want to uh, introduce yourself uh, quickly. Hey, everyone. Renee Angela Mock, uh, Program Evaluation Support Manager at Mentor Maryland, D.C. Okay, and away we go, folks. Feel free to keep the chat box coming. We are going to um, keep a lively chat box. That is one of our, one of our hallmarks of programming, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, let's jump in. Um, so, first and foremost, welcome. This is, you know, fairly standard fare at this point. You know, the bottom line is that if you have not seen some variation of this over the last uh, 15,000 Zooms that you've attended, you know, go back and, uh, you know, watch those recordings. But, you know, generally, generally basic stuff. Control your mute button, please. We, we all got some form of kids, pets, or uh, a pet kid uh, running around somewhere that are liable to jump on your screen. We get it. It's all good. Just don't unmute. That's all we ask. Just don't unmute unless you're just making a point about what is being discussed. Um, most importantly here, you know, when you're in the chat box, please make sure that you are uh, chatting to everyone, uh, which is cool. So uh, you can use the chat box for those aha moments, for anything that comes to your mind, questions to us, questions to each other. Um, really, really awesome stuff there. And then um, the last two bullet points are really the most important points in this slide, right? Which is all about giving each other, uh, especially us, space and grace. So I'm sure we're going to make a mistake at some point. Um, this is, uh, this is natural for us as humans, um, but, but, uh, also give yourself space and grace as well. Like these are still a trying times, um, as, as soon as we get, you know, a little bit of steam in terms of getting back to normal then bop, new sort of a COVID variant, or there's a school closing or somebody in our personal families gets sick. Um, and, and, and guess what? We got to be flexible. We got to adapt. We got to, we got to make it happen because these young people are dependent on us. Um, so again, space and grace, seriously. And then obviously have fun and learn. Um, uh, as, as we'll get into the topic for today, um, there are any number of, of, of key pieces that you can take away uh, from today. And, and we challenge you to really take those notes and, and think about the one thing that you can walk away from this conversation um, with some steam to be able to implement in your respective organizations or programs. So again, welcome, and we're excited to be with you all this evening. Um, and with that, I want to pass it to um, to our uh, uh, amazing co-hosts and sponsors of this event um, and, and, and this entire training series. That is the Baltimore Children and Youth Fund. We're joined this evening by uh, one of the BCYF uh, lead admins, and that is um, Shaq. I think I saw Adam in there as well, but if you all want to take it away and kind of give an overview about uh, BCYF, this series, et cetera, that'd be awesome. Absolutely. This is Shaquille from the communications team with the Baltimore Children and Youth Fund. So first and foremost, thank you everyone who showed up tonight. Um, this is critically important. And tonight's session is about curating our authentic youth voice. And I'm very excited that BCYF is about to roll out a program I can't give too much information about it, but we're going to make sure that we do exactly that in Baltimore City. So be on the lookout for a huge announcement coming up, uh, an honorarium of an amazing Black woman uh, who has impacted so many young people in our city. I was one of the young people that she impacted. Um, and, and we're going to be making sure that we do exactly that at, at, a, at a, a high administrative level in our city, curating authentic youth voice. Um, we are a unique um, fund. We're a quasi-city agency um, that provides resources to the community, uh, and that is through grant making, through providing free technical assistance, through providing communication support with the organizations that we work for. Um, we are poised to be a leader um, in this field in the country, and you are, are part of this happening and then a part of making us a leader in the field uh, nationally. So give yourselves a pat on the back. 
Um, thank you for coming. And Sadiq just put up, or someone just put up our guiding values and principles. So I'll run through those really quickly. Racial equity, intergenerational leadership, community ownership, and collective decision-making. Those are our guiding principles. Um, and with that, I'll shut up and I'm gonna turn it back over to our amazing presenters. Sadiq, if you will. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Shaq. I, like, I'm excited now for the announcement, man. You, you, you got me uh, you got me teased. Um, I'm, I'm definitely uh, excited about that. But again, shout out to BCYF um, for, again, just, just the amazing partnership. And again, just being committed to the young people of this city and continuing to be innovative in the way that we go about leveraging the youth fund uh, to ensure that uh, folks have the capacity to do this work really, really well. Um, so yeah, super excited. So moving on, uh, again, this is part of an ongoing series, uh, hosted, co-hosted, co-facilitated, co-moderated, co-designed by Mentor Maryland DC, along with our partners at Strategic Resources Group. Um, but for those that don't know, Mentor Maryland DC, we are one of 25 statewide or regional affiliates uh, attached to uh, the National Mentoring Partnership. Um, and we have a mission to increase the quality and quantity of mentoring relationships and to close the mentoring gap. We achieve that work through uh, really three core pillars, one of which being quality uh, of the work in the mentoring field. And under that umbrella, we host trainings and convenings and provide technical assistance to um, the hundreds of different mentoring programs across Maryland and DC, our region, and just generally champion this intervention known as mentoring. As we know, it's critically important to overlay relationships on top of everything that we do. But tonight's conversation is really about the how we go about doing that as we engage our young people. Um, so super excited about that. And again, proud to be partnered with SRG, um, who really oversees the uh, management and e evaluation and tracking to ensure that this training series goes the way it's supposed to. A little bit more housekeeping here. Today is session number nine. So we've, we've been, I don't know if y'all can still hear me. It's like I froze. Okay, there we go. I'm back now. Uh, we've been on an amazing journey these last several months, going all the way back to April when we started this thing. And now um, down here in the August session, which is again, incorporating authentic youth engagement. This is a plug. Uh, we're having our small group deep dive on this same topic. So any questions, comments, pieces that you'd like to, to dig deeper on in your respective organizations, please, please, please join us on Friday morning, this Friday morning. Um, in exactly 72 hours, a little less than 72 hours actually, uh, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., we'll be di digging deep on this particular topic. And then obviously stay tuned, make sure that you're registered to attend our September 28th sessions, that is engaging families and youth development activities. We cannot be working with young people if we're not working with or thinking about bare minimum about families in our work. Um, and then uh, we're gonna be uh, doing a youth development 101 for coaches, which is again, there's a startling stat that tells us only uh, about one third of coaches nationally, listen to this stat y'all, only about one third, and this is according to Aspen Institute research, only about one third of coaches nationally have received any type of training. Listen to that again, only one third of all coaches have received any type of training as it pertains to anything. Uh, so let that sink in, followed by, uh, we'll be making some really, really cool announcements about our virtual youth development forum scheduled for, you guys can uh, uh, hold these dates, save these dates, uh, November 11th and 12th, Renee, please check me on those dates, November 11th and 12th. And uh, we got some really, really exciting stuff coming down the pipeline as we wrap up this series this fall. Um, and then lastly, our agenda before I pass it to Renee to get us started. Um, we're gonna do a little bit of an icebreaker here, but um, that was all just the wind up, y'all. So we got some really, really um, exciting information to share, um, all about critical mentoring, youth centrism. We're gonna do a little bit of a breakout activity. We're gonna share some case studies, both from, uh, from us, from our perspective, as well as we wanna hear from you all, because this is not going to be us talking at you all for the duration of this presentation that we can assure you all. Um, we're going to uh, answer some questions, um, and again, that's not just going to be us answering those questions. Um, and then we're going to just talk some, uh, some wrap up and some next steps. But again, super excited to be with you all this evening and really looking forward to the small deep dive session of Friday morning as well, uh, as well as the rest of our time for these uh, for these next several minutes. Renee. Hello. 
So welcome everybody. We are about to get our icebreaker started and we did just link the deep dive in the chat. So um, we do have to do a separate registration for that. So it's not up now. But anyway, I'm gonna send you to this website for our icebreaker. Link is in the chat. I'm gonna share my screen quickly. So our question for you all this evening, we're talking about youth voice and um, what is it like for you know youth voice to truly be authentic and to make spaces where um, youth feel that they can use their voice. So I wanna pose to you all to kind of think back because I find that reflecting on our own experiences helps us um, interrupt the potential a bias that we apply to these new experiences and learning we're trying to do to revisit our experiences so then we can look at um, currently what's different. So the question for you all is, what was the first time you felt empowered as a youth, as a young person, at whatever age that occurred? Going to college that I paid for on my own. Yeah, <laughs> I hope you felt very powerful. That's amazing, congrats. Yeah, that's so cool. Being accepted to a leadership program in high school. So definitely. And what are those kind of structured opportunities are, I mean, ideally, hopefully created for, for youth to feel powerful with their voices. That's awesome. Having a teacher that's in the reading, seeing my artwork on display at school, selling candy at a Little League game in the chat, being a main speaker at my church, opportunity to speak and um, see your work. That's awesome. I remember first seeing, now that you said that, I remember my, seeing my artwork on display for the first time in school too. Really cool. I love that. And, and this, this, this comment is, I think, get, getting us warm. It, it's, it's like warming us up. Being a main speaker at my church as a young person, being invited to share. Think about that. What that did for for that then young person's psyche and self esteem and confidence. We getting warmer, y'all. Oh, taking over the class, being able to creative writing, performing music in front of an audience. So again, showcasing your skills. We got to ask a clarifying question: Were you asked to take over the class, though, as a seventh grader? <laughs> right. That's the question. Was it yeah. some kind of emergency? <laughs> That's a good point too. I remember a teacher for a day project, very memorable experience um, in high school. Facing fears and accepting leadership um, positions that I was qualified for. I called myself up for not cleaning, only having us clean. You got so mad, you knew I was right. <laughs> so your first um, argument and negotiation, your first litigation. <laughs> That's awesome. I there was it. one right before that. Scroll down, Renee. We, we... Oh, okay, okay. Wow, yeah, that's a good yeah. one. Performing music. Yeah. It was an emergency. The teacher got sick. So you really trusted. That's great. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, so I hope sharing these have made you think about, you know, the context of which these things happened to you, how you were feeling the adults, the specific adults um, who created those spaces for these opportunities to happen for you. Um, so we can kind of think about that and how we can do that same thing and, and apply it for um, our young folks. I'm gonna pass on over to Sadiq. Those are some great stories. I love it. Really good. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, now that, that, that was super, that was super fun. I think the other thing to think about as well, Renee, as we get into this conversation is, you know, what was the first time you felt empowered, but uh, unpacking those feelings of empowerment. What was it about that circumstance, right? Like really going back there, like, cause we got a, we got another couple of minutes on this, but I would love to hear from folks how those experiences made you feel. Cause I just projected some words, but how did those experiences yeah. make you feel? And you know, what was, what was some of the conversation that happened with those adults that, um, that, that, that shared those, those experiences and those opportunities with you all. We'd, lo we'd love to spend just a moment on that. 
So I'm going to add in one more thing. They created a radio program in middle school that was broadcast to the whole school. Ooh. That's dope. How, those, how did those experiences make you feel? Now, nah, thank you, Kelly. Independent and free. Oh, I don't know. Did we just close the poll, Renee? You can type. You can type the question. Yeah, I can. But how do those experiences make you feel, you all, that you all just described? Because this is a critical moment, right? This this icebreaker is absolutely by design to have us project those feelings, right? Because inherently, we know what to do. Some of us know what to do as it pertains to youth centrism but we've forgotten it along the way, right? As we grow into our adult thing, right? And doing our adult thing, we suddenly, once we hit a certain age, we think we got all the answers. Proud and confident. Thank you, Jeanette. Capable, empowered. Like my perspective was important and I was creative and thoughtful. That I mattered. I'm adding that in there. My words, not, not, not Ingrid's. Hers were enough but that my perspective was important and I was creative and thoughtful. Whoever ICCI is, feel free to put your real name. I'm just gonna just go with it and just call you ICCI Zoom account. ICCI Zoom account says mine was doing an activity but being trusted to create something that was of worth to other people and that their voice was considered credible. Think about that, credible, capable, trusted, powerful, proud, confident. I really hope y'all are writing these words down. This chat obviously is gonna be captured. Made me feel like, I'm, I'm guessing Mike, cause I know Mike, I'm gonna I'm tease him. I'm, I think you meant knowledgeable, which is dope if that is what you meant. Are we gonna go with Nold? I'm just picking with him, Space and Grace, right? Look, look at me, Mr. Space and Grace. I wanna point out that Wanda said scene. And that on our youth panel the other week, that was what every kid was asking for from adults. They said that they wanted to feel seen. Hey, we got Sierra now. We know who Sierra is now. Valued and respected. Think about that. Think about that word. Do we respect young people? I know we love them. We support them. We serve them. Let's spend a moment on that rhetorical question. Do we respect young people though? You see, that's a different, that's a different, that's a different vibe, y'all. Do you respect young people? Do you respect young people? And if you do, how do you show? We can stop the we can stop the presentation right here with this question. Thank you, Baba Richard, representing SRG. How do you show respect for young people in your programs? Let's marinate on that. So with that, um, look, we're still making great time. We're gonna keep it rolling, y'all. We're gonna keep it rolling. Great. Okay, so, so we wanna jump into a little bit of uh, a critical mentoring overview. For those that have not seen this book now, take a picture of this slide, go and get a copy of this book. Um, some really, really great news is that we've been talking about this for the last couple of sessions. We will be actually sending out a couple of lucky uh, attendees to past sessions over these last couple of months. We'll be actually receiving a copy of this book in the mail along with their self-care box. So again, if you registered for, for any of our previous sessions, stay tuned. Uh, as they say, the check is in the mail. Um, but for those who have not seen this book, let's do a quick straw poll. One if, 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 if you've seen this book, let me see, no, a one if you own this book, a one if you own Critical Mentoring, tremendous resource. Two, if you've never heard of it before. Three, if you've heard of it, but ain't never read it. One, if you own the book, and I'm gonna assume that you own it, you read it. Number two, you've never heard of it, never seen of it. Three, you heard of it, but you ain't read it. Okay, okay. So our job is done here, Renee. There's a, there's a ton of number twos here. We here for the number twos and the number threes as an endorsement. Um, so we've worked closely with Dr. Tori Wieson-Sertan over the years. 
um, in developing some of our work around critical mentoring as an organization that is Mentor Maryland DC. She's also um, worked extensively um, with Mentor National around the development of several tools um, around critical mentoring. And I would just say right now, for those of you all, this is your first time hearing of this uh, tremendous work, strongly, strongly recommend that you all, again, stop doing what you, I mean, not stop listening to me, but like immediately following, we're talking at 731, place the order for this book. It is absolutely pivotal to your understanding of doing this work with and on behalf of young people, most importantly with, because on behalf of is cool, but as we're gonna dig into, with is way more cool, right? Um, so critical mentoring, please, please get that. So straw poll complete. So this is gonna be a little bit of an overview. And um, again, just really, really strong endorsement of this book. So let's jump in here. So critical mentoring as a guide, uh, was released back in 2017. And there's, there's a couple of main points that we wanted to touch upon here um, by way of a very high level overview. Um, and that is, you know, number one, uh, as it pertains to youth development as a field, as a thing, as this living, breathing entity, is this understanding uh, and acknowledgement that if our young people's context were air and water, they would be too toxic to survive, right? Which really gets to the core of understanding what is our mentoring for? It's, the, it's one of the first questions that we gotta ask ourselves. What is your mentoring for? You see, because if it is solely to adapt to toxic, uh, homogenous, hegemonic, patriarchal frameworks and paradigms, we would submit to you all collectively that your mentoring is flawed. If your mentoring is just about assimilation and, and just going along to get along, but with no critical context to how things got to such a need for mentoring, so to speak, we, we're missing the boat. We're missing the, fo the boat, folks. Uh, I'm getting a little bit of feedback too, um, Shaq, Renee, if we can look, um, there's somebody who's not muted right now. We're getting a little bit of feedback. Um, but that's the first piece to really dig into is context. We have to stop asking young people to adopt, to adapt to toxic environments, or better yet, in our programs, just arming them with the gas mask and hoping for the best. So that is the context, right? In the opening chapter of the book of Dr. Tory's book, that is a critical, critical point um, that is underscored. The second uh, tenet here, if you will, um, that we wanna uh, talk through very briefly um, during this overview, this idea that you know, mentoring without a critical lens, and, and in this case, as it were, a critical race theory lens, which is everybody's favorite thing to talk about, especially if you, you, know, if you identify any family members on the right. CRT is the new boogeyman. Uh, right up there with, you know, with BLM and a whole bunch of other stuff. But I think CRT has almost superseded BLM as the new boogeyman. Um, you know, I'm about to say some, some real controversial stuff, so I'm going to keep it here. Listen, um, Critical Mentoring and Dr. Tori and her research, um, they, they've done a really, really powerful job of looking at the intersection of critical race theory and this thing called mentoring, this intervention called mentoring. And some of those uh, core tenets of CRT were key in, in, in devising this, this, this new paradigm, if you will, of critical mentoring. And that is, i.e. racism is, is in everything that we do. It is baked into the DNA of this country. And if you all don't believe me, here's another book that strongly would recommend, uh, uh, Black Butterfly. Black Butterfly. If you all have not read Black Butterfly yet, oh my God, if you need some, because folks are always like, oh, show me one racist law. <laughs> we can show you a couple. We can show you a couple, many of which are still on the books as we speak. So critical race theory uh, is really arming us to think, again, with a critical lens, with an, an infusion of the idea of intersectionality that not only are our young people dealing with racial trauma, they're dealing with trauma associated with being an immigrant. They're dealing with trauma associated with their orientation or their gender identity or expression. 
they're facing trauma uh, around their socioeconomic status and whether or not they're on free and reduced meals and whether or not you know they can afford the latest Jordan, so on and so forth. So critical race theory really, uh, I think, combines to uh, to really give us a a, a, potent, a potent mix um, and, and foundation to look at our mentoring practice through the lens of intersectionality. And then guess what? If we get these pieces right, equity follows very, very closely. And I think a lot of times we start with equity, but we're not looking at the whole person. And that includes uh, many of our staff members as well, because guess what? For our staffs, a lot of us have not acknowledged the intersectionality of our staff. I just had a call with uh, one of my mentees literally right before this meeting. And one of the questions he asked is like, man, how do you navigate as a black man in this toxic environment? How do you navigate? And, and we just had an amazing conversation literally about 15 minutes before we started this. Um, so that's critical race theory uh, to, keep it, uh, to keep it moving. Um, I think next, when we talk about tenets of, of critical mentoring, understanding again, the, 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 what mentoring was for versus, versus what, is, what is mentoring now and how it, how it has evolved. And this idea that tradition and norms versus what was needed given the context and how that has unfortunately evolved or should I even say devolved into a current viewpoint of lens uh, or, or current lens that looks at mentoring as really uh, the key to how to fix black and brown youth. Right, which really comes from this twisted lens that black and brown youth are inherently and fundamentally broken and pathological, meaning that there is just something wrong with our young people, as opposed to, again, going back to the context, maybe there's something wrong with that school. Maybe there's something wrong with their neighborhood that they had no part in designing. Maybe there's something else amiss elsewhere. So understanding sort of the context and, um, and I won't just say uh, racist history of mentoring, but I will say it was a pretty exclusive uh, club uh, for what mentoring sort of started off as and, and sort of what it is known as now. Um, so again, very, very important to look at. Uh, fourthly, as we talk about youth centrism and, and how we move along here, um, getting into again, some of the additional nitty gritty um, of, of today's conversation, this idea of being youth centric. And like we just said, do we respect young people enough to involve them in that which would benefit them? And for many of us, um, due to you know, our own uh, traumatic experience as young people, due to uh, flat out uh, adultism and ageism, um, due to just flat out fear and not really recognizing the fact that young people have really, really valuable contributions to make besides just being young and bringing youthful energy, right? That's one of our favorite sort of coded, coded language, right? Phrases to be like, you know, to really say like, I don't really value anything else except your physical stamina. That's problematic. And that's just one of many problematic sort of statements and paradigms that we think and that we make uh, as directed at our, at our young people. So this idea that young people aren't our clients, right? Uh, they aren't being served, but yet they are our partners and collaborators. And dare I say teachers in this work and guides to us in this work, which again, many, many times is, is a inverse paradigm of what we're used to as it pertains to youth development. We are the wise old people pouring into the young people. There's nothing that they could possibly tell me except how to use social media, right? <laughs> wrong, wrong, right? They can't tell me anything except, you know, whatever it is that we ask young people and that we typically kind of just put them in the box of being able to, to teach or tell us about as adult practitioners. So this idea that young people aren't, uh, aren't clients, they aren't being served, um, but they are partners, they are designers of their own destinies. And um, you know, really, really, we need to start shifting our mindsets, which lastly into those intentional shifts, um, 
looking at not uh, uh, just one corner of our programs, but rather how do we incorporate this mindset, these shifts into every piece and facet of our programming? And this is something that even as Mentor Maryland DC, we've uh, particularly struggled with. But uh, as the leader of the organization, I've come to conclude very, very recently that they're just excuses. They're just excuses. Now, again, granted, we have to provide space for folks to be able to talk through them and, and, and to talk through those challenges for sure. But at the end of the day, they're just excuses for why we don't have more involvement of our young people, why they are not in the driver's seat in almost every aspect of our programming. They are just excuses. And we're talking about program setup, funding, marketing, uh, recruitment, for staff members, recruitment for your volunteers, your mentors, all of these different elements in many regards need to be completely revamped and reimagined um, as it pertains to our program. Oh, and then another one that we can look at here as well is around, um, uh, is around performance metrics, how we're managing the success of our programs. All need to be re-examined, folks. All need to be uh, re-examined. So, I want to just pause right here for um, for reactions or uh, for for any additional thoughts that folks who type that number one in the chat box uh, would like to add, please. See now, y'all typed the number one. Y'all gonna leave me hanging here? <laughs> Actually, wasn't that number that many number ones as I'm looking back, which is a good thing. Some of y'all were too scared to vote. It's all good. We said no judgment, y'all. We said no judgment. I'm gonna call on my friend Jeanette. What would you add in? What would you add in? You've done some amazing work with our partner organizations. Ms. Jeanette Simon is with us, one of uh, Mentor Maryland DC's amazing uh, technical assistance consultants, and who always humors me when I put her on the spot in sessions just like this. Um, Jeanette, anything that you would add? See, of course I called on her when she went to go get her coffee. But how does this resonate? Thank you, Ingrid. We got, we got one comment. Um, Ingrid sh uh, shared this all really resonates and, and, uh, and has her wheels turning about all the work that I um, slash we have to do. Um, well said, well said. Any, any other reactions? Any other reactions to what was shared? Again, this is just a very, very high level overview in, uh, in the hopes that you all will, will investigate this amazing resource um, by yourself. I can also give a little bit of a sneak preview um, for those that are familiar with our seminal series um, the elements of effective practice for mentoring. If not, we will drop that link here as well. Um, the EEP for short, um, I can share with you all. Hopefully I'm not out of line to Mentor National. Um, oh, it's all, it's all love, Jeanette. If, if you want to chime in now um, or in the chat box, feel, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, while Jeanette's joining, I will, uh, I will add that we're in the process of actually creating a, uh, an official elements of effective practice supplement, which is going to really dig into uh, more of the implementation uh, uh, support around looking at critical mentoring in you all's respective um, programs. So, and Nia, we can see your name. <laughs> All right, so we're going to keep rolling, y'all. Uh, Renee. Oh, hey, no, I have one other slide. I lied. <laughs> I lied. I lied here. Um, oh, wait, Sierra says in the chat, this makes you want to be more specific about what we can truly offer as a mentoring program. Woo! Such an amazing point, Sierra. So many times we write checks that our programs cannot possibly cash. Cannot possibly cash, Sierra. Great, great point. 
And Nicole said the youth that I work with would definitely echo what was mentioned. Many adults treat them like they need to be fixed. Absolutely. And we got to stop that. So here are a couple other elements that we want to throw out here. And that is checking the process. That is checking, checking the process. And we're going to dig in more, uh, more on this um, as we dig into defining youth centrism. But this is really like a three-step process that we want to share early, especially for folks that got to hop off. Take this and run with it. Listen, number one, to the folks who will benefit from this work. Build with the folks who will benefit from this work. And then obviously creating the space with those folks who will benefit from this work. And again, that is not us just kind of creating 95% done, right? The program we just show up is 95% complete and we're just like, man, enjoy enjoy like we got to get to the point where we see that is 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 almost disrespectful and this is back to to one of the uh, first points that we made right do we respect the young people right and think about for those that you engage with that you do respect that there is no hesitation on whether or not you respect them how do we go about engaging with them to the leaders on the call how do you show your team that you respect your team i'm willing to bet it is by allowing them, right, and providing the opportunity, the conditions, the space for your team to vet your ideas and trash them if necessary. If we agree that it's not a good idea. But for many of us, we don't have that same faith in our young people. And, and this is an open invitation for us all to continue to rethink, uh, for us to continue to rethink um, how we uh, deal with and address and work with our young people work with, keep underscoring that, work with our young people. All right, so now I'll pass it to you, Renee. Thank you, Sadiq. Um, I hope that intro to our critical mentoring was uh, meaningful for those who have not read the book yet, um, as we're gonna be exploring more and more concepts about when you do read the book, um, we all be like, oh, I already know a little bit about this. Um, I'm gonna go to the next slide, Sadiq. So we're going to focus the first portion um, of our time together here about youth centrism, but you know, a really um, critical um, aspect of critical mentoring. So we're talking about youth centrism, we're talking about centering youth leadership with voice, power, and choice. So how are we making sure that we're genuinely sharing power with young people and not just lending power, but truly sharing it? Uh, as something that we both use to will to be aligned um, in our goals with young people. <clears throat> when we say youth voice, it's not just the opportunity for youth to talk, right? Not just about voice, but about that listening, the other side of it. When the, when youth have voice, what are we doing with their voices once we hear it? So not just that the mechanisms for them to give feedback are there, but that something's happening with that feedback. And stakeholders are listening and things are shifting um, to truly include um, their voice. And, and again, Steve's talking about um, all these things being at every level of programming, from funding to what's happening on the day to day. And then again, sharing power. Um, many of us from the better seen, not heard generation um, didn't necessarily have a lot of power sharing. Um, it's something you see, we're seeing more and more um, across family dynamics and, and every other places where youth are. So we're talking about truly sharing power and, and being, like um, Sadiq said, uh, co-leading rather than leading youth, but truly sharing the power that we have, which I'll talk a little bit more about um, with our youth and choice. So giving youth options, youth love options, <laughs> as, as we might expect. Um, and I'll say, I like to live at heart, and I love options too. It, it means more freedom um, and more opportunity to reflect. So giving youth choice, as many choices as possible, again, at all those levels. Is it at every step of the process that we are serving them? Is there a voice there? Are we sharing power there? Are we giving youth options there? Are there choices for them to take? I'm just seeing your comment. How do you stack up on the elements? Great. So we're gonna go into a little bit more specific on this next slide about some other elements of youth centrism. <clears throat> Pardon me, when I click through Steve. Mm -hmm. 
it. Yeah, my my, uh, my slides are are like stuck here, having a little bit. I told y'all space and grace. Y'all thought we was y'all thought that was just a line. <laughs> well, someone wander in the chat. We started a youth council asking them to tell us what is working and what isn't and how we can improve. Nice. Yes. We want to hear definitely more of these stories as we go on as we get more and more perspective about what um, true youth centrism looks like. Should I turn on my slide, Steve? Maybe? I think I got it. Got it. Back, baby. <laughs> okay. Um, so those elements of youth centrism, recognizing our positionality as adult allies. There is a power dynamic between adults and youth. Um, Sadiq mentioned adultism earlier, and that's a really um, important topic to explore further with yourself, or with your staff, with anybody who's working with youth. Um, and as I always say, if we bring something up and then you want it to be a training later, please let us know. Um, adultism is a, is a huge topic, but again, we have to recognize that in the end with our relationship with youth, when we're trying to share power and things like that, there is a certain positionality um, and power dynamic for us being adults and what it means to be an allyship um, with youth. And next up, creating spaces of safety and development for young people by acknowledging their obstacles. So creating those spaces where youth can reach their highest potential and can develop to their highest potential. Um, there is, and we've already kind of talked about this a little bit, this idea of viewing marginalized communities as needing to grow in resilience, but we want to acknowledge the power and the resilience that's already in these youth communities, and that our job is to create those spaces where they can feel safe and where they can develop, and that we are acknowledging the things that they're going through when they're not in our space, um, but they have space with us to process those things um, and continue to grow, and that kind of bi-dimensional growing. And then lastly, validating them through power sharing and co-conspiratorship. So, we're going to continue to talk about power sharing throughout um, this entire presentation because it's, it's just so important. And that, especially for us, when we're talking about pro existing programs, building these things in and restructuring power structures is difficult to do and difficult to do it authentically. So we need to be reminded about, again, how do we do it at every level? Um, how are we co-conspirators? co-conspirators or co-leaders in these programs in, in these communities where our youth are. How are we doing that truly together um, and sharing the power that we do have? Because we know that your programs are making impacts um, in our um, pillars of, of the community. So how are we going to ensure that more and more stakeholders, particularly specifically youth, um, are helping to, to power and, and lead your program? Next slide, please. Do we want to get some reactions from these? Oh, yeah, please. Oh, I think someone wrote in the chat. Nicole wrote, young people are truly equal partners in the process of advocating for the well-being of our young people. Yes, I know a social worker who would always say uh, people are the experts of their own lives, not just people, you. <laughs> They're the ones who are there and experiencing it. Um, so again, giving them time to use the voice and for us, again, to be doing that listening. Uh, they know the context of what it's like when they show up at your program and, and what it feels like and what they're looking for. So again, are we giving them the power of voice and choice, the opportunity to um, share their experiences, the power to influence program, um, and the choice and love what that looks like? Uh, Sierra is raising her hand if you'd like to come on mute. Yeah, so um, with these sort of three things, it's something I it's like what I used to do in the classroom because I realized with students, honestly, with people, we don't always understand how people perceive what we said. I'm guilty of that all the time. I'll say something and no one understands what I'm talking about. So the first thing I had to learn to say over and over was, so what I hear you saying is, <laughs> and so clarifying what they say, and then, um, so we would, we would clarify, we would validate that, okay, that's like, we, I understand that this is what you said, that's an, that's an okay thing. And then we would explore from that point on what, what we can do with the, what the student said, whether it was positive, negative, or just like exploratory. But, um, but I don't know, honestly, just building in myself key phrases that I just kept using because I didn't know how else to handle the developing mind of a middle schooler. It kind of worked, it kind of universally worked. And um, it's something that they pick up 
if you use it enough too. And they start to um, use those same techniques. Great, that is such a good example. And you're reminding me, right, once we are inviting you to be in conversation, that's not to say that suddenly they're going to communicate in ways that we understand. <laughs> We're coming from different places. Um, and depending on the age of the youth, um, will affect their ability to communicate. Um, we've all talked to, you know, younger kids, elementary age kids who, <laughs> but you just have to laugh because you cannot understand what they are saying and <laughs> what they're trying to get to. But if you ask enough questions, I promise that you can get there. Or with teens, I always talk about this, um, about teenagers specifically, um, because of the their, where they're growing um, in this, this stage of development, it's the hardest time in their lives for them to communicate. This is why we always say that teens are always, that, that stereotype of, teens fighting with their parents, it's because they have, they're having a literal communication issue in their brain <laughs> trying to get that information out. So again, once you've invited the voice in, how are you making it a space where you're actively trying to ensure that you're truly hearing and listening and getting to the point of what they're trying to share? Because that's not always easy to do. And again, it might mean you need to be creating more time or a new structure, a new procedure for this thing to really take in what youth are saying and not just what we think they're saying or what we're assuming that they're saying or getting at. So that's a great point and a, and a really good practice. Um, it can be difficult when you're not used to being in those spaces and including youth. No, that, yeah, I, I agree, Renee, that was, that was so good. And I would also ask, uh, ask the group, because again, we've emphasized it now a couple of times, how, how do we uh, individually, or how do you individually define power sharing? How are, you, how are you defining right now in your mind power sharing? We're gonna get there in a second, but I'm just curious, you know, what, what comes to mind? What's your initial reaction when you hear the term power sharing as it, um, some of y'all don't even wanna share the remote. What does sharing power mean in the context of your, of your youth development program or practice? What comes up for y'all when y'all hear that? Power sharing with young people. How do you define it? How do you feel about it? What comes up for you when you, when you, when you hear that term? Giving everyone an equal voice. Because this is an important concept. If we just go back here, right? If we look at those three elements, voice, power, and choice, and how it connects to those emotions, those feelings that we all describe during the icebreaker, because that's the connection that we want to get to. The connection between voice, power, and choice connected to those feelings that each and every person, even if it was only one time of which you growing up, we've all felt, we've all felt when power was shared with us. Think about that. Some good feedback. Ah. That. Yeah, go ahead, Renee. Yeah. Oh, good. no, it's 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 been good. Good. the shot's blowing up. I'm trying to keep up. The transparency, autonomy, um, allowing them to be a part of major decision making, not acting like they're collaborating when you really Ooh. already made the decision. Hello. I think everyone can admit to Come on. that. Come Anyone who ever negotiated with a child has done that for sure. <laughs> Means adults are not the sole leader involving youth, you sir. Giving them opportunity. Can we just go back to what Ingrid said again, though? Mm -hmm. That is so deep. And again, counter, think about the democratic process so-called in this country. We got to make sure we're not, do we not doing what the bad politicians do, y'all. Acting like you're collaborating or that you're really listening, but you're really waiting to respond, A, or B, you've, worse, you've already made up your mind and it is purely performative. Think about what we've seen over the last 18 months, y'all corporations making statements, oh, we're, we're gonna do better. We wanna be better, we are better. But then turn around and no action is taken after us completing survey after survey, focus group after focus group, listening session after listening session. How are we gonna do it different with our young people, y'all?
giving them the reins occasionally for various situations where they might need experience. Interesting, Sierra, giving them the opportunity and creating a platform for their input ideas and initiative. I think Sierra brings up a good point. So it's not just that whenever there's adult, an adult standing up in the front of the room, there's also a kid. It means that sometimes just the kid's in the front of the room, right? Just when there's other times, there's just an adult in the front of the room that we're, you know, we're truly sharing power. And then I just wanted to share what I think about, um, you know, from the developmental relationship framework, one of the elements is sharing power. And they always say that means treat me with respect, going back to respect, treat me with respect and give me a say. So respect me, include me, collaborate with me, and let me lead, right? Not always just co-lead, but uh, um, let, let, let me lead, um, let a child lead and take over for a little bit, <laughs> to the least. Cool. Hey, can, can, can I ask one more question, Renee, of the, of, mm -hmm. of, of the group here? Because if we're going to keep it a buck, we got to keep it a buck, y'all. <laughs> How many of you all right now are screaming on the inside with anxiety and stress with the prospect of letting your young people lead without interruption? Let's, let's, let's just have a gut check moment right there. How many of us are screaming, again I say, inside with anxiety, you know, stress at the idea of letting our young people lead? Mia, thank you. Kelly, thank you. Sierra, that's true, that's true. But it shouldn't, and that, that's the key, Sierra. It shouldn't, it shouldn't depend on the group. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Linda, not screaming, but not, but not sure how to start. We're gonna get, we're gonna get into it a little bit. Because the bottom line is that, all, do we respect young people or not? Because I ain't say, do you respect some young people? We ain't say you respect the ones that got straight, that you only respect the ones that got straight A's. That you only respect the ones that dress real nice and smell real good and come from two parent households. I didn't say, do you respect them? Of course the answer is yes. But do you respect young people, yes or no? Because if we do, it should not matter the group. There is value and power in every single young person, especially knowing that they coming up in a world that we as adults, we're okay with creating. Let's keep rolling on. And that ain't, and that ain't no attack on you, Sierra. You just said what a lot of folks are thinking. That's why I asked that. Like, that's all love. Like, I really appreciate you sharing that, just to be clear. Because I, too, have been scared. Like, I don't know what that one going to say. Who has a young person like that they're working with right now? Give the microphone to anybody but her. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We got those young people in every program. Renee, you had one of those before, right? <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah, so just to acknowledge again, we talked about this a little bit. Adults, we're coming through that position of power and privilege with our age. And for our young people, the nature of being young um, is to be, to be without agency, especially those dealing with systems. So thinking about um, systemic racism and the like, the more and more systems a child may be involved with, the more disempowered they may be. So. It's not just that I'm a kid who's not allowed to make most decisions for me anyway, the more I may find myself in a system, the even less empowered I may be. So we have to acknowledge that um, when we're thinking about incorporating youth centrism and youth power, voice, and choice um, at every level. Next. So to get into some of that how that we've been wondering about, <laughs> um, you know, how do we get out of the way? Like I said, it's not always just about stepping aside, but sometimes about truly getting all the way out of the way. So um, when it takes time to kind of consider these questions and this will lead into our breakup, you know, where is youth voice absent in our organizational structure? And I'll preface this too to say that these are gonna be some kind of tough reflective questions potentially <laughs> where you might feel, um, you know, it, it's, self-reflection, which is never easy in this work, which is why we have to do it. So 
considering where is youth voice absent in our organizational structure? Where are we not seeing youth or hearing youth? What do young people have to say about your work? Have you asked? <laughs> are you gonna find out? Um, should you feel safe in your space and why? And then when, we, when do we ask you to operate in ways that are more comfortable to us? So going back to what I was saying about communication, we, we're communicating one type of way. Um, are youth welcome to communicate um, how they truly communicate? Or are we asking them to um, position themselves or to emulate something else to be in communication or to um, access power or, or choice or voice? It's a tough question. That's why we're going to give you time to think about that. <laughs> so we are going to, it's gonna to go to the next slide, the deep. Oh, actually, and let me copy these questions into the chat for you all as well. So you have them as we go into our breakout room. So we're gonna break out into small groups for you all to discuss these questions, which you will now, now find all four of them in the chat, even when we break out. Um, so I'm going to get those started. It'll be about 15 minutes. Let me go, no, now I gotta do math. One, two. <laughs> Right. Let's do five rooms, four five. rooms. Five rooms. Five. Be a little small. Yeah. Five rooms. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Give me one second. I see some people dropping off. Don't leave before the breakout room. It's the fun part now. Don't leave. Yeah. Now. Don't eat our food and then leave. No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. They're only going to come back with. Um, great insights is what I love about doing this. So we are about to break out. You should automatically be moved to the room, but if you need help, um, give a shout. Okay. Awesome. Uh, we're going to pause the recording. We had a bet going to see how many people we lose. I would have won. That's not bad. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, I hope that was a fruitful time. And actually, I'd love to go and give each group an opportunity to just kind of share a major takeaway from visiting these questions or a thought that maybe a thought or question that came up. So I'll just shout out your number and feel free to raise your hand, come off mute right in the chat. Um, what came up for you in your group? So group one, breakout room one, how'd it go? Oh, I'm not, sure. You are. I'm not sure which break, which room I was in. Same here. <laughs> I don't think oh, we okay. that number. Oh. Well, all right, then we're doing open share. Please raise your hand and come off mute. Or, or we can call it out right quick. Room one was Frank, Ingrid, Isabel, Monica, Sophia. Frank, Ingrid, Isabel, Monica, Sophia was room one, AKA group one, jump in. I can share a little bit. Um, something that I thought was kind of eye-opening was thinking about the safety question. Um, and I really thought about emotional safety, like what does it mean to make our students feel emotionally safe, especially this past year? Um, and then of course we talked a little bit about COVID, um, but what I struggle with is kind of making sure our students feel safe to tell us when they fail and like when they're struggling. And oftentimes they feel like they need to only come to us when they have like something good to share. Um, and so building that emotional safety net where they feel comfortable and trust us enough to say that, um, and then also the other piece of creating a safety net for families. I think all the time we work with students, but we're really working with the entire family. And so building that, that safety and that trust with them um, is important. And this is Monica. One of the questions that um, we dug in a little deeper, what do, you, what do young people have to say about our work? And just talking about ways that we can get feedback from them. Um, not just in the beginning of programming, but throughout pro programming, even if it's asking questions um, along the way, so that we are providing their voice to be heard. If they're receiving uh, suggestions from them, that we can try to implement them as we go along the program so that they can know that they are being heard and, and what they 
say manners. And then of course, when you said survey, Sadiq, right before we broke, like I shuddered. <laughs> but um, of course, she's in surveys as well um, at the end of an activity or the actual program to, to gauge and gather that information. Um, and young people, are, if we create, in my opinion, if we create a space of um, they feel safe, they'll tell you the truth. Um, <laughs> sometimes it's hard to hear, um, but they'll they'll tell you the truth. So that's absolutely. And I think you may have a great point about collecting feedback along the way, because it's along the way where a kid's going to make the decision. Uh, this is whack. I'm out. Right. Then and kids fall off before we reach the end of this project or initiative and things like that. If you're not getting feedback until the end, well, that kid's no longer there to give you that feedback. Um, catching that along the way and adjusting accordingly, that's that that circle of a really empowering voice. Thank you. That's great. Glad you all got there. So room two was Sierra, Gabby, Nicole, Noraline. We shall uh, free. Hi. Yeah, hi. <laughs> um, this is Nicole. I'll jump in really quickly. Um, the first question that was asked was, where is youth voice absent in our organizational structure? We all come from different organizations, but we all agreed that, um, uh, or a few of us agreed that uh, the hiring process, uh, when it comes to um, having those interactions with youth, the adults interact with each other differently. So if you don't actually have a youth there or have a youth be able to ask questions or um, be able to uh, connect with those people that you're bringing into the organization, it's really hard to actually know how they interact with youth and talk to youth. Um, from our perspective, my perspective as working with um, student health centers, you know, those are barriers I can put up if people don't feel comfortable with their, their providers, their medical providers and people like that. Um, and then also uh, that was brought up a lot, or the feedback, uh, feedback, feedback was brought up is getting feedback from youth uh, during the process and at the end um, as ways for them to feel safe, um, ways for to figure out what, you know, what they think or what they say about our work. Um, yeah, that, that was what came up with that as well. Great. Awesome. Um, room three, Pooja and Richard. Jack, you got stuck in there. That was an error. <laughs> if, I, if I can just add in one thing real, real quick yeah. too. I just wanted to say that was an amazing point just around the hiring process. Just wanted to echo that. Uh, because again, what, what we value as adults joining the team, they might be red flags for the young people and uh and vice versa um so i just um i just really really like that point that's an excellent point so yeah i'll do, we'll do room three and four because they're small so puja richard linda mr carson michelle wanda do you want to share out any of your group's takeaways I can share how um, a lot of us in, I think we were group four, um, are in different settings. And a, a general challenge is finding new opportunities for youth voice. But um, I think what we discussed more is um, how we currently are trying using youth panels and um, places where we think that we could um, ask them what needs improvement in a large way. Yeah, you have a great point that for a lot of organizations as they sit now, uh, the space for youth voice is not there. <laughs> so it's one of those things where maybe we gotta tear some things down a little bit and rebuild to ensure that it really is it really is truly incorporated and enmeshed on what your program's trying to do. Awesome. Then our last group, room five, uh, Michael and Nia. Uh, this is Kelly. I was in um, that room, hey, with yeah. uh, Michael and Nia. Um, one thing that hit us all as far as uh, where is youth voice absent in our organizational structure, and we all felt like we needed it, was having um, youth representation on our board of directors. 
but none of us have it. And I just think that's something I'm looking into right now. And I just think it's pivotal to, to have that youth voice on the board as we're making decisions that affect the organization and the program. Totally. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it, it makes so much sense because we think about what the role of a board is, it is to have that higher level visioning and influence over what, you know, where an organization is going. Um, so of course, if we're thinking about youth centrism, I, if there's a youth would need, would need to be there um, to ensure that we're, we're centering their voices. Awesome. I'm glad you guys had such great conversations and even were able to relate across the different contexts and formats of your program. So we are going to get into case studies, and I'm going to hand it over to Sadi for some examples. Hey, hey. Um, if I could, even before we uh, before we jumped in, I'm always like, hey, one more point, one more point. But again, these these were such excellent points that were brought up. And um, before we moved on, though, one one uh, really two additional points, uh, both on these questions as well as um, when we talk again about the definition of youth centrism is. Point one, you know, someone asked earlier, I think it was Linda or, or at least a couple of folks brought this up in the chat box. And that is, you know, where do we get started, right? And we just want to illustrate um, and, and, and really share this idea that we, we also like, it's complicated and important, but don't overcomplicate it. Take these four questions tomorrow and or at your staff meeting next week and hey, ED, and if you're the ED, just turn around and ask yourself, hey, use, take these four questions and dedicate half or whole staff meeting to answering them and brainstorm right away. If not, why not? How can we? Like start right there. Next step, buy everybody in your organization this book. I do not receive a cut from each one. Let me be clear on that. Uh, but we believe in it so much. Have everybody in your, in your, in your uh, org get a copy of Critical Mentoring. Order these for everybody right now. But start with these four questions tomorrow at a staff meeting, send them out via email. Hey, everybody answer these, and we're gonna come back and answer them at the next uh, staff meeting uh, as, as a unit. So there's a number of ways to get started literally tomorrow without overcomplicating it and or forming another committee, right? Anybody here love committees? Let me see a show of hands. Anybody love committees? Is it the, Anyway, okay, uh, one is like, no, no more committees. Um, so that's point one, right? Uh, point two, really quickly before we move on, is that this idea, I'll bring back up the slide one more again, um, is to Renee's point. This is, again, such an excellent um, definition. Again, this is, this is directly from our friends um, at the uh, Critical Mentoring Institute. But one thing that we want to point out to folks yeah, hey, touche, Monica, touche, touche, not a bunch. Yeah, all right. Touche, Monica, excellent point. Um, but this idea of centering youth leadership with uh, voice, choice, and power, we want you all to also picture these three elements as a continuum, right? Um, these elements of youth centrism as a continuum, right? Starting off with voice being sort of like the entry level. Like, hey, you you on the right path if you are at least listening and bringing in some youth voice. Next step is youth choice. They like, do they have a choice, even if it's a bunch of false equivalents and choices that we gave them. Hey, at least at least they're choosing a little bit. But true power, true power and co-conspiratorship, right? As we get into um, to the next piece, right? As we talk about some of the how and where we're headed, the true power and co-conspiratorship is where we ultimately wanna end up. So we wanted to just call out um, those points. And again, these questions are a very, very nice gut check, or mini organizational assessment to dig into. And uh, we're gonna move into these case studies, which will end off um, today's conversation in these next couple of minutes on uh, some potential ideas and actions that you all can take tomorrow. And again, we the beauty is that Half of them have already been shared out as potential ideas in the chat box already. Uh, again, which is uh, which is which is beautiful. Uh, Linda said, "Can we post those questions again in the chat?" Yes. Okay, so can we post those for Linda once more? Okay, so let's get into this. 
All right, so a couple of case studies. And again, we're going to be really, really uh, quick. So that way we can hear um, from some more of you all in terms of, again, what has worked well, because that's the beauty. That's the other key thing is that we've done a lot of this work, sometimes accidentally, right? Or kind of like, um, I don't want to say sloppily put together, but certainly hurriedly put together, right? Um, but we've got a lot of the elements in place for how to do the work already. And I just want to be clear on that. Um, so with that said, um, just a couple of the initiatives that we put together as Mentor Maryland DC over the last couple of years where we were challenged to do more of, listen, not just showing up with the idea fully baked, but bringing in young people to consult with us, design with us, um, and get paid for their service to do something for other young people. So an example that we wanted to share is um, the early part of this year, uh, February of 2021, um, again, one of our young people on, on staff, um, one of our AmeriCorps VISTA members, uh, Ms. Olivia James, who literally is a brand new uh, recent grad uh, from University of Maryland College Park, came in again with so much youthful energy, that's me being tongue in cheek, um, but just came in with not just youthful energy, but a lot of really, really amazing ideas. And one of them um, is as we talk about how to continue our um, uh, our desired, if you will, um, or mission-oriented leadership around really just putting our money where our mouth is in terms of making sure that we have programming that was equity focused, that was culturally relevant, um, et cetera, for the young people. And this is what we came up with, or, or this was her idea. It was like, man, we need to engage high school students because we've been doing a bunch of adult roundtables around a lot of uh, issues um, related to uh, police killing community members and uh, uh, performative actions and, and flat out racism inside Maryland public schools and across uh, public school dis districts and schools across the country. When do we get a chance to share our voice? So we said, boom, let's put it together. So we had to catch ourselves early in the process though, because it was becoming clear early on. I don't know if y'all can tell, I talk a lot and I'm really excited about a lot of stuff. And that's not always a recipe for success. So I had to take a step back and, and you know, as kind of like the, the key adult, the old guy in the room was like, man, this is what young people really need. You know, we said, hey, no, we need to not design this at all. And we need to get a group of young people from some of our trusted programs, put them together in a room, which is what we ended up doing. Um, we just really came with a very broad idea and vision. And over the course of several sessions, again, that we compensated young people for, they came up with the questions, the format, they hosted it, led the breakout sessions. And it was an absolute resounding success. We had almost uh, 100 students from across the state participate in a really mind-blowing conversation that, was, uh, uh, that had depth, that had substance, uh, but most importantly, that they led and were excited about. And there were many actions um, that came out of that conversation that we're really, really proud of to, um, to have hosted and, and, um, and had a hand in bringing to life. So, that's kind of point one that we wanted to share. And then point two, and then we'll open it up, is very- Can I interrupt very... really quick, City? Yes, please, please. I just want to say, so Sadiq mentioned uh, compensating youth, which is a huge aspect of youth centrism. Um, I think what when we're at work, or if you're doing something that we're doing, if they're co-leading, they should also be compensated for their time. This is a huge- um, Thing what we need to consider when we're talking about critical mentoring and youth centrism for sure. Um, often younger kids, they don't even really understand that you're at work. I remember I used to tell Mr. Renee, be like, like, Mr. Renee, you're at work. I was like, yeah, this is my job. <laughs> like, I'm here for you, but I'm at work. They, I mean, they really, like, they don't get it. So, you know, make that clear and that you do value their time and their voice and their, and their choice because you're, you're obviously being valued in your place of business because, you know, it's, it's the job that you decided to do. So, um, compensation, I feel, is so, so important, and I'm really about paying people, but kids especially, you know, for, for the hours given, because it's the most valuable thing. And, and, and Renee, thank you for that excellent, excellent point. And if I can, again, speak even more transparently, um, our organization internally, I ain't going to tell you who did what, where, who, but I'll just say our organization internally, We've made the very, and listen to me, y'all, 
we made the very recent call to pay young people equally to what we pay adult contributors of the programs that they're a part of, which we didn't always do, shamefully. But again, we're all learning, we're growing, we're open to the feedback. But if we're giving the adult moderators, presenters, uh, you know, a $150 gift card or stipend or whatever for, for participating, why aren't we giving the exact same amount to young people? Sound familiar? Gender pay gap, anybody? So again, we gotta, we gotta put our money literally uh, many times where our mouth is. And again, do we respect young people? Back to that. Do we respect young people? If so, pay them the exact same amount as the adult, the adult facilitators. I don't know about y'all, but when I was a teenager, I had big bills and it consisted of going to the mall. See, that's me being, again, tongue in cheek, right? That's me being disrespectful. But I just want to call that out though, right? Paying equal pay for their contributions, et cetera. And then when we have the opportunity, pay them more, pay them more. Thank you for that, Renee. If you want to talk a little bit about the youth panel right quick, Renee. Who, me? Yes. So um, yeah, it's just for the week. I hope some of you were there because it was absolutely um, amazing, but we had put together um, a youth panel for our Maryland Genetic Youth Conference. And I'm hoping maybe some of you have had the experience or assuming that you've been at like a really forced youth panel where youth are forced onto a stage because people are trying to center youth voice and it's like awkward because people aren't prepared and people are nervous and this, that, and the other. Um, yeah, it, there are more bad youth panels than good ones I'll say. And, I, I, and I'll say too that that takes time and effort to do. Um, and we were able to invest that time and effort to put together this panel um, that hopefully the video will be up on YouTube soon. So keep in touch on our, our newsletter and things like that because it really was, I'm still thinking about the things they said all the time. But um, besides bringing all of our youth together, um, of course, compensating them for their time and being clear about that upfront. Um, in that top left corner is our youth facilitator who I guess he was identified at the last panel, Sadiq. Exactly. We found yeah. Jesse here top left um, because he participated and was was one of the designers and just did such a, an amazing job. We're like, hey, Jesse, you want to help us design this other thing? And he said yes, because again, I think I think he felt that we respected him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in advance of the actual panel, um, we were able to bring the youth together. Um, briefly respecting their time. Um, we had written out, you know, a very skeletal amount of questions, of course, that we um, shared with them directly so they could, A, make their edits um, to, I mean, A, to invite them to do edits, not just be like, think about your answers, but, you know, do you want to answer this question? Is this question meaningful for you to answer? Are you willing to share? Of course, because no one should be on a panel and get a surprise question like that. It's not respectful. So they were not able, only able to review the few questions we had written out. They wrote questions. Um, they had their edits. Um, Jesse, as a moderator, really fulfilled his role well and, and reviewed how he would, how he thought people might answer and how to direct conversation and things like that. So literally on the actual day um, of this panel, we were able to 100% turn it over um, and they filled, and they, and Jesse was able to facilitate this truly, truly um, amazing panel where every, every youth um, got to share their story and, I mean, teach us all something. People were I was, I'm still blown away, um, but it was awesome. And I think once you experience something like that in a real youth-led event, you see uh, the red flags from the past of times where people maybe thought they were doing it, um, but they weren't. But I don't know if you had anything else to share about this specific panel. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, I'm just looking, we're getting close to time, y'all. We're heading towards conclusions. Stick around. We got a couple more really uh, really, really cool pieces to um, to share. Um, they were both recorded. We we made somewhat of a pact with the participants because it was such a sensitive topic for the uh, Maryland high school students' form of race equity that we would not share the recording, but uh, share the themes. But um, as Renee just noted, the uh, MD4Y panel should be available um, very, very soon um, on our MD4Y page. So please stay tuned to on our mailing list. If you haven't already subscribed to our mailing list, please make sure that you do that. And um, yeah, we're gonna share that with folks. But um, really quickly, 
Oh, here's some additional questions. Before we do that, I wanted, wanted to pause here for just a minute. We have like two or three minutes. Um, what, uh, what would you all share additionally in terms of uh, amazing case studies or things that you all are really, really proud of that involve voice choice and power, right, with your organization? And again, even if it was scary, because guess what? To Renee's point, we turned over the whole thing to them. And were we, were we on the sidelines for a little bit? Like, you know, like, right, hoping, like, this is our event. Absolutely. But that's part of our growth as well. That's part of our really, really believing and, again, putting our money where our mouth is. Do we respect these young people? Do we respect their ability to perform? And guess what? If, if it didn't turn out perfect, their learning experience is more important than our perfection. Their development is more important than somebody thinking that uh, uh, we did it perfectly. And that's the choice a lot of times, right, that we have to make is, is it about their development or is it about our reputation, our personal comfort? And when we answer that question, again, respectfully and thoughtfully, it's not even really a choice at all. And, and that's what allowed us to get through. Absolutely, Wanda. So um, what will folks add? What will folks add here? Please please share any, 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 you know, any moments that you all are proud of. Um, that have come up that have come up recently for you all in, in this in this work of authentic youth engagement. I know it's some amazing stories and case studies out there. We got time for like one or two. I'll jump in. This is Monica. Hey. Hi, hi, hi. I apologize for my lateness. I actually was wrapping up a pilot program uh, for some young people uh, around the life, the narrative of Frederick Douglass. And, and for the first time, we used a program called Flipgrid, which is really new to me. We partnered with uh, Baltimore City 4-H. And so that gave our young people the opportunity to take the topic, think about it, record their thoughts, their, uh, what they had learned. Um, and we gave them the liberty whether they want us to be on video or not. And a Flipgrid um, platform is really great because it allows them to be creative. But for those who might be introverted or kind of shy or not quite confident about showing their faces on screen, it still gave them an opportunity to record or type their comment um, or add different features to their videos so that they could still be engaged. So um, we... Um, awarded those who are really engaged um, in different kinds of ways. But um, I just wanted to shout out my crew it was about 20 young people that um, came in. We had children, youth from um, Virginia and Maryland involved. It was a pilot program, but um, the feedback we got from the young people is that they didn't want it to stop. So we have to carry on in the fall. So <laughs> I think that is the greatest testament of whether something is working. If young people say we want to keep going. So that's, that's my, my shout out. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, Monica, I would ask like what, what like direct feedback, uh, and I don't know if, if, if it's too new where you haven't gotten that feedback yet, but like, number one, it sounds amazing. But number two, I would ask like what specific, what specific pieces did they say they really like mm -hmm. and, and, and or mm -hmm. Did they have a part in like designing or, but specifically like what parts did they really, really like? Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Uh, so we did get that feedback and they actually did some of that in their Flipgrid videos. Um, some of our young people just really liked that they were learning something new and that there was information that that was in school, but they didn't get the whole picture because we really dug deep um, and integrating um, the different aspects, just them being able to bond with youth that are not in their own state. Um, we had people uh, of different cultures, so they like being able to learn from each other um, and having young people who came from other places than they did. Um, and if I can just throw on something that some feedback that we got was that some of the kids said this was too much like school. Um, and we had to take that, you know, um, that was valuable, valuable information so that we could tweak it along the way. So I hope that. 
That's perfect. That's exactly what I was looking for. Thank you so much. All right, y'all. Anybody got one more? We got one more? We wrapping up, y'all. Stay with us. 15 minutes. We out of here. Youth voice choice power and action. Case studies from your organization. We can just keep talking too. That's cool. Sadiq, I'll just say something yes, brief. Right, please. I, you know, when we all had to pivot to, you know, virtual at the start of the global pandemic, you know, we realized really quick that, you know, we needed to, you know, you know, do virtual events and, you know, what we needed to do. And we started off with not having youth on the panel or not having them included. And we, we realized real quick that, you know, that's not the greatest. And every panel going forward, now we have youth and they seem to engage more with with each other. What what was the aha moment, Mike, where you were like, this ain't this ain't well, it. This ain't the well, it the well it was it was really kind of hard too because everybody was just we started really early, like in I think April of 2020. Of doing virtual events and you know we were like oh gosh you know there's just not a lot of participation i mean there's a lot of people that logged on but there was no sort of feedback so then the next one we were like oh well let's let's you know the person that does that david miller hey hey said we need to have youth on this panel and you know then there was a little bit more engagement that's great and, and then I, as they, and I'm sure it, it went up from there as they started actually designing this stuff too. Well, I wish we'd have let them design more. That's been we we've, we've got to we've got to work on that. That's still something that it's hard because, um, especially for me as coming as a being a meeting planner and working at the American Bar Association, you kind of don't attorneys don't have time to design so. You get in this mindset, oh, you you know, get a group of committee, design it, and then go with it. Whereas that really doesn't translate to youth. They need to be the one designing the program. So it's it's learning. I mean. Now I really appreciate the transparency. Really appreciate the transparency. We're on this journey together. Ask them lawyers, do y'all respect young people? They'll probably tell you no. Then they probably answer honestly. No, I'm just joking, man. This is, they don't even this, respect this young lawyers. I, well, I mean, I think it's it's I mean, it's changing. Like the ABA <laughs> that I worked at four years ago is not the same ABA now. I mean, they it's just it, but it's good. I mean, it's a good change. And you know, these pro and I will say firsthand, being younger 40s, I'm glad y'all are having these programs because it's really eye-opening and it makes me want to forward thinking and change that's right that's right much love to you mike thank you for sharing <laughs> uh play, playing along with us right here we wrapping up y'all uh renee we got some additional questions here for folks um yeah, think I just, about, do some homework with i just want to say sadiq since this is being recorded uh the comment that mike made does not express the views of the aba <laughs> oh yes it definitely does not i don't work for that <laughs> <laughs> the devil does not. Who popped in and said that? That's shot. That's shot from BC <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, it definitely does not express the music <laughs> ABA. I was so, being I was being funny, but that's yeah, awesome. no. <laughs> Great. Uh so some more of those questions um for us to do that reflection about. And while we won't have time today um to get into all of these questions we will in, in the small group but just to kind of piece them now you know is your mission youth centric i love this question because missions and visions are often so far away from even frontline staff um let alone um, the youth that your organization aims to serve how can you include youth in carrying out the mission again in that, that shared work what processes do you have set up that can be reimagined and restructured to include young people so again um, where there's no space now, we're going to have to do reimagining and restructuring. And how do we do it? And then how do we sell it? Because someone's going to have to buy it <laughs> to make it happen. So maybe that be that bought in um, at all levels. Have your program goals been devised alongside youth? Again, let them speak to you know what their 
their goals are because their goals involve them. And we out there setting goals for youth, if they're not bought in, it's just not going to happen. What roles can young people play at each level? Again, from that front line to where many of you may be, to the boardroom, to the higher level execs and administrators, where can we make sure that young people are at every level? And then how can young people be included in facilitating pieces of training, organizing events, handling day to day? How are they bought in? So um, Sadiq and I forgot to bring a youth tonight. That's on us. Um, you know, if organizing events, when we're talking about the case study of, of the youth panel, uh, including the youth in our organization really um, helped, helped to be genuine, really genuine for, for youth voice and handling the day to day. Um, where, where are youth and what's their role? Awesome, awesome. So again, we told y'all this was just a sneak preview and we had a bunch of really, really cool stuff um, to share with you all. This is one of them. This is called the Youth Center Work Guide. So um, this is actually Dr. Tori's organization called EMON, um, the Youth Mentoring Action Network. Um, so this was actually a guide created by uh, the young people in her organization. We are going to actually send this out to those that attended. Um, tonight um, it is an amazing tool that really provides examples directly from young people, um, both communal and individual approaches to really emphasize that um, and examples for the following. So um, again, how to develop uh, a mentoring framework, right? Uh, how do you welcome youth into the community or into your program community? Establishing structure between youth and the organization. And this fourth bullet point is such a, a, a critical point. That's this idea of, again, allowing you to rely on your organization's leaders for future career resources or just a resource in general, right? Because a lot of times folks think that, and now we're getting into some of the youth development PYD processes and, and framework, is that our youth workers should be seen as resources to the young people that they serve and be connected to other resources in the community. But a lot of times our program staff too often are seen as glorified either babysitters or just straight up disciplinarians, right? For the program youth, keeping them in line, et cetera. But are they actual resources for the young people in the program is a much better question. So this youth centered work guide um, is directly from the, uh, uh, the voice and the minds of young people. And it's just an amazing resource. Uh, moving on here. And Renee. Yes, yeah, so some of these actions that we can take in the meantime, besides taking those questions to your organization. Establish youth positions on your board of directors. You guys you know, came up on that idea. Again, youth see programming from the inside out. They should be able to articulate you know, what works well and what doesn't. Um, dedicating staff positions to youth. So again, if they're helping you out with that day-to-day, -day, then they work there and should be compensated accordingly. Um, giving youth the role of program evaluators. Again, they have the eye of, is this working or not? Or is this helping them reach their goals? Um, <clears throat> if the program does not work for those we serve, for those kids, but no matter how shiny and new the program may be, it's for the adults. It doesn't, it doesn't work. We, we want to make sure that, again, this program is working for the, the kids in the program. So we hope that you'll, you know, this may be the beginning of you making commitments to some of these actions. Um, but again, we'll talk about more of that in depth on Friday. Yes, yes. So while we're wrapping up, oh, thank you, Renee. Um, you all have been awesome. We got, we got you all for uh, seven more minutes. So don't leave yet. Take this survey. Let us know. How you, uh, uh, how you enjoyed this presentation and some of your key takeaways. Thank you all so much for being here. Do not leave, do not leave until you complete the survey. If we can drop this link in the chat box. Yeah, just Renee. Mm -hmm. it's um, good, nobody has left yet. What is Friday? So yes, we're gonna talk about Friday in one second, but we're gonna get this link out, pull your phones out, get this code going so we can get this survey done. There it is, it's in the chat. Okay, so now I'll move on. So Friday, great question, is our small group session. So this Friday, 10 a.m., you can catch me and Renee and um, our team for SRG. 
um, we'll be all together Friday morning in a, uh, a much sort of lower key Zoom room where we can actually, again, talk through ideate brainstorm together on how we go about this, right? Picking one initiative and just kind of talking through it together, how we want to get that done. So uh, Renee just dropped the link for registration for Friday. Um, or you can scan a QR code there. We also, hey, invite you all to, um, this is again, all sponsored by BCYF. We have an amazing opportunity to, to work one-on-one -on -one with one of our technical assistants, uh, consultants on going deeper on this or, or other topics related to your mentoring program. No cost technical assistance, you know, emphasize free 99, uh, to sign up for technical assistance. You guys want to visit that link, which Renee also just dropped. We got some links popping for y'all in the chat box. So please make sure that you sign up for that up to, I think right now we have a couple of slots left for up to 10 hours, again, of no cost technical assistance on building out um, different elements of your youth mentoring program. Absolutely amazing. Um, and then the final invitation that we have for you all as you all can see from this amazing background here in my Zoom, uh, in my Zoom world, in my virtual world, this is our strategic plan. We just released this in January, um, January, in July, about six months too late. We released um, need links email. Okay, Nia cannot open. We'll we'll email all the links. No worries, Nia. Which link can you not open, Nia? Because we'd say like five links. <laughs> it's a lot of links we know. We're sorry. All right. Well, Nia's letting us know what, what link. We invite you to uh, we invite you all to our final strategic plan release forum taking place tomorrow at 2 p.m. Tomorrow at 2 p.m. to learn all about the Mentor Maryland DC brand new strategic plan, uh, which we are calling Growing the Covenant. Um, and again, that is a covenant between us and young people, between young people and us, um, that really undergirds uh, the work um, for uh, our young people on behalf of our young people. And again, as we just learned, right, with, with our young people. Um, so yeah, so Nia, so Nia, we just dropped a bunch of links um, in the chat box. Nia, can you not see those links? So once get again, our email. okay, awesome, awesome. So first and foremost, again, type a one if you if you guys completed that survey already. Type a one if you completed that survey for us. Thank you, Nia, for being here. Shout out whoever was here from Seattle, Washington. We caught that, you know. We 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 global, y'all. We global. Thank you, Wanda. We got a survey here. We had one other thing here too. Um, yeah, we already talked about this. No time for questions. But we got three minutes though. This has been amazing. Any final thoughts from folks? Really, really appreciate you all. Amazing energy. Agree, Monica, great conversation. Final thoughts from folks as we uh, as we check on out of here. Type a two in the chat box if you got something that you're going to take back to your organization ASAP. Type a two in the chat box if you got something actionable that you're taking back to your organization ASAP. Okay, okay. So two people enjoy um, got something out of it, Renee. So you know, at least it wasn't zero. No, we're just joking. We're just joking. We know. We know y'all are completing your survey right now. Your eval. That's why you're not in the chat box. <laughs> Were the reflective questions mentioned when organizers preparing for a new year? Yes, the reflective questions. Yes, upcoming virtual town hall. Yes, get them in the design seat, Mike. Get them in the design seat in the driver's seat. It's painful, but it's got to happen. Daddy. See, that's my son right there. He's ready for playground. Can I open my cot at the playground?
Can you open your kite in the playground? Yeah. That's our cue, ladies and gentlemen. Y'all have a beautiful evening. Please we will talk me. to y'all soon. Please. Hey, man, I'm finishing up a meeting, man. Can you please? A meeting. Can you meeting. Please?